Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everybody. Aha. Good evening. My name is Eve Moran. I'm past president of this historic arts club, and I'm so excited to be with you all at this special event. Look out. <laughs> Look out the windows at the great water. Wild and still, strong and fragile, always and ever changing. Look around. Look around the room, see images documenting water, sand, and ice around the beaches of Lake Michigan. See nature heightened in the pursuit of personal vision. See art that tells in intimate terms of the beauty that resides within and alongside the great water. The art we see is the work of Alan Sue, and it gives me pleasure to introduce this remarkable artist. Alan received his Bachelor's of Science in Photography in 1974 from Southern Illinois University, and his Master's of Fine Arts slash Photography from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1981. He has received awards in photojournalism and was the recipient of a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and three Illinois Arts Council fellowships. Sue's work has been published in many regional and national publications. Since 1980, he has participated in both solo and group exhibitions. His extraordinary ability to capture profound moments in remarkable places, coupled with meticulous craftsmanship, place him among the best photographers of his generation. It is an honor and a joy to present Alan Sue. Are you sure you were talking about me? <laughs> so, so I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank uh, Cliff Jewellers for hosting this event. And I want to thank Trisha Ricketts for writing Speed of Dark. Um, about three weeks ago, I didn't know who Trisha was. I had never heard of speak, uh, Speed of Dark. Uh, she sent me an advanced copy, and I took a look at it, and um, I found it intriguing. And I did a little more research on Trisha, and I found that we grew up living about three blocks away in, in Evanston. 
Uh, she was a year ahead of me, so uh, I was a junior. Uh, oh, okay. No, I was a year ahead of her, and she was <laughs> 10 years my junior. Um, and we had a common interest in Lake Michigan. Uh, I had walked to the lake many times uh, from Evanston to Lighthouse Beach, and on better days, I would bicycle to Gilson Park. And I learned that she did the very similar thing, uh, so we had that in common. Uh, later, sometime in the 70s, I started photographing around the lake. Um, and I had discovered there were things happening out on the ice that I hadn't realized. Um, long story short, it continued up until this day. And while reading Speed of Dark, I started learning about the forces that influenced me in my photography. Uh, I started learning names like uh, Aurelia the Sun, Phaedros the Wind, uh, La Lunette the Moon, and Gaia the Earth. And I realized it wasn't just me who was finding an interest in photographing the lake. Uh, the ice was being formed by very definite forces um, that other people were aware of, uh, namely Trisha Ricketts. So, um, and one thing I found interesting was in the reveals on the back of your book, uh, one of them mentioned that you have uh, a trait of bringing yin and yang relationships uh, to your characters, to your work, uh, uh, to the plot, to the story. And that's one of the things that I've seen out on the water. Uh, I'm not always able to, to photograph it, but I see it. Uh, these opposites that happen. And um, I'm very excited that you've been able to write about it and uh, bring a better explanation to myself. So uh, thank you very much, and here's Tricia. Nah, nah, Trisha needs an introduction. <laughs> she writes, alone in the comfort of solitude, feeling the rising passion, mastering the chaos, wrestling with the creative muse. She writes, breathing words and checking their sound, taking detours, shaping sentences on the road, stopping to dance with phrases. She writes her imagination burning, picking up voices, meeting with spirits, finding the magic in each new thought. She writes in all hours and over the days, pushing out the untold story, typing ever faster. It happens with speed, it happens with the speed of dark. Ladies and gentlemen, we gather today to celebrate the release of a new work, The Speed of Dark. We gather here joyfully to celebrate the author, Trisha Ricketts. She who writes, and in doing so, feeds our souls. It is only fitting that we are here at the Cliff Dwellers for this exciting event. This is a club shaped by writers such as Hamlin Garland, Louis Sullivan, Carl Sandburg, Roger Ebert, and many others. It is a club that understands the power of story. It is a club that nurtures art, artists and rejoices in their work. Trisha is a dear member of our club and an important part of our arts community. And so we are delighted for this moment. In this time and in this space, we join together to celebrate her passion, 
creativity, and achievement. It is with great pleasure I now ask Trisha Ricketts to take the stage. I told her that she is the best MC ever, and now you can see why. <laughs> Eve Moran, oh my gosh. Well, <clears throat> thank you all for coming. Your help in launching this novel, which has been a lifelong, I, I would say pursuit and goal, is really wonderful. And it's just touching to me. And I'm honored by every single one of your presences. It really is meaningful. But before I read a bit about my novel, and I do want to do a reading from each of the three voices that are in here, I need to acknowledge some special people. So first, a hearty thanks goes to Eve Moran, the Cliff Dwellers MC extraordinaire. I am so grateful for her words, her aplomb, and her kindness. And come on up here and get a little gift from me. With Speed of Dark Whiskey. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And to Alan Sue for sharing his beautiful photographs, which express the love that we both feel for Lake Michigan. And to Keith Bringe for bringing this exhibit from his rare nest gallery. There's Keith, and we've seen Alan. Special, special thanks go to two lifelong friends, and I am not kidding, since we went back to kindergarten the year after you, Ellen. And trust me, that is really a long, long time. Their continuous support and recent beneficence helped me bring this book launch to the Cliff Dwellers, and they are Linda Dunn and Casey Byrne. Please come up and get your little... But I'm also so deeply grateful to my beloved daughter, Carolyn Paw, and her beloved and beautiful daughter, Lola Black, who traveled all the way from Kansas City to be w here with me today. Would you stand up in the back? And those two are kind of killer on that little square thing, if you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, finally, I am deeply indebted on so many levels to Peter Hurley whose encouragement, love, and support has assisted me in riding Speed of Dark to the finish line. For me, he's a rich strike. <laughs> so I would like to do a, a reading from each of the voices in Speed of Dark. If you would like to kind of sit back and get comfortable, I want to give you a taste of each. I think each, each voice takes about eh, seven minutes, maybe a little left, less than that. And the three voices are mostly Albright, a 55-year-old black man, Miriam Phillips, a 50-year-old white woman, and Michigami, our wonderful 14,000-year-old Lake Michigan, right out there at you. So the first voice is Mosley's, and this is a flashback that actually occurs maybe 40 pages into the book, but I think it explains pretty well why he is such a deeply spiritual human being. Cornfields, fall. He was tall, wiry. It was 1968 and old Mosley hadn't been dubbed old yet. Still looked like a greenhorn even though he was past 20. Fitful as a caged fox, he waited on a patch of road between cornfields, probably Iowa. Could it be Iowa? My, how he wanted some water. Something cool enough to take the heat out of his belly and plentiful enough to wash the dust out of his throat. He saw the plume of yellow swirling at a distance long before he heard the sound of the truck's engine. A smile broke out on his face, and he couldn't help bouncing from foot to foot. No Lindy dance, just eager, happy. He stuck out his thumb, and then the apprehension set in. Black boy in Iowa? Could be tricky. An old Ford pickup with chrome fenders that 
no longer shone, slowed. The driver's side door was dented in the shape of the state of Kentucky. Oh, he knew that shape well enough. Home for him. Working the coal mines over in Harlan County after high school. But times were getting rough. Less call for coal. And he'd lost his job and had taken to the road. Of course, that was after he'd been run out of Lynch with a bruised heart and a love of the hooch. Mosley leaned his head barely inside the window. Heading west? The old farmer nodded his head, pointed to the seat. Hop in front where I can see you. The man was thick-jowled with a greedy look crowding his eyes. Mosley's stomach clenched like it was waiting for a sucker punch. Thank you kindly, sir. Mosley opened the door, which barked on its rusted hinges, and placed his satchel in the crevice behind the seat. The old farmer nodded again. I don't cotton much to talk, boy. Keep quiet, and you can ride with me until we get to Indy. That's where you get out. Mosley kept his eyes straight ahead. Yes, sir. Well, at least he knew he wasn't in Iowa yet. Got a ways to go. The wind whistled past him in a lullaby. Those sounds and the softly bumping cab made his eyes heavy and allowed him to forget the seriousness of his thirst, the hollow in his gut, and the wistfulness of his memories. Soon, he was sound asleep. What woke him was the lurch. Disoriented, Mosley couldn't shake the warmth from his head at first. He looked at the old farmer who was slumped over the wheel. The truck bounced crazily across the culvert and crashed through the barbed wire fence. Dirt ricocheted off the dashboard. When it clipped the telephone pole, the truck flipped once, then again, rolling in a fast somersault down a steep embankment, glass flying everywhere. Then the sky and land went a jumble and his stomach clenched in a knot of death fear. During one of those flips, the roof cracked open and the next thing Mosley knew, he was flying out like a trapeze artist. No safety net, no one to catch him. He landed on his right hip and shoulder at the edge of a corn row bottom of the hill. The feeling was like a sledgehammer pounding into mud. Searing pain sliced his head from a long gash, temple to jawbone, sliced through by a rusted piece of barbed wire lying in the field. For a moment, he lost consciousness. And when he came to, he turned his head a bit and saw the pickup, which lay upside down, front wheels spinning like some bug trying to right itself. Old farmer must still be inside, Mosley thought. The effort of craning his neck was painful, so he turned his head back, trying to gather from the inside whether or not he was going to live. He looked up into the sky, watching silt and particles of dirt filter down on him like dust storm debris. If somebody could just get me a drink of water, I'll be all right. Then he began to float, light as a bubble from a child's breathy blow, out of this weighty earth and ground. Up near the searing blaze of the sunlight, he rode on waves of a mystical current wider than the cornfields which spread out below him. As a silken cool surrounded him, he watched his own body going limp, arms losing gesture, face falling into blank. A thought flared in Mosley's mind. This it? A moment's drift into a peaceful distance and then this? No terror about it. This was, could he even think it? Beautiful. Where was the die which fear he'd known during childhood nightmares? If this was death, it was saying, come here, man, listen to this. And then, sure enough, chords began to rumble. Ancient drums joined the bouncing lightscape. Ivory riffs started low, escalated into drog shrill whines. One vibrating note midst what sounded like every atom in the universe sending out its own single note. This was something he could feel deep inside. He was becoming the sound. So the second voice is Mary M. Phillips. And it's in the real time of the book, which I set in Y2K. And I'll be honest with you, the reason why I set it in Y2K is I did not want to deal with cell phones. <laughs> I mean, they're kind of a character in our lives, aren't they? So anyway, 
It's the vernal equinox, which is meaningful because on March 21st, that's the day when the planet kind of wrestles between light and dark. Miriam is sitting alone at her kitchen table. She's lost in the memories of her losses, her Mamie, her grandmother who raised her, Jack, her husband who left her for another woman, and Petey, her beloved son who died from a freak bacterial infection. She plans that this is the day she's going to end her life. Ellen's her next door neighbor, which comes in briefly. Anyway, back door, 7.22 AM. Blasphemy, Mary Margaret. It's against God's will. Well, you'll just have to understand, won't you, Mamie? Of course, there's no response. Miriam stares at the page of her open journal, and it stares right back at her. Nothing comes from nothing, she thinks, and puts down her pen. She picks up the trib, hoping something will grab her. Her eyes wander to her hand as it holds on to page three. Small, delicate fingers that look like Mamie's, exposing the history of their life in their topography. She drops the trib and traces a finger across the vein that writhes up the back of her hand. Like the very snakes that slivered off the green isle at the blessed Padraic's command, Mamie would say as she studied her own hands. Then she'd shake her head and laugh, and me getting closer off to the slithering off, like it was no big deal. A rush of fear races up her spine as she imagines the lake in front of her until she sees Mamie's face again. Courage, dearie. We can do anything with a bit of sand in the craw. Oh, how Mamie had believed in her. Always said there was something mighty about her. She'd grab her and hug her hard into her pillowy bosom. Mind, you come from good Irish stock, dearie. Fit as a fiddle and ready to take on the orange men. That was Mamie, full of faith and feist. Miriam takes a sip of her coffee, but it's gone cold, bitter like everything else. She looks around the room, her eyes slowing at Petey's colored pencil portraits, which hang on the opposite wall. And there they are, all in a row, as though he'd just drawn them yesterday. You were pretty good at catching expressions, weren't you, Petey? She asks this out loud. Hers is the first in the line, a mild surprise showing in the arch of her eyebrows. Mama, <laughs> you're making the just before look again. And she'd quickly lower her brows and try to look solemn, which would make Petey laugh, which would make her laugh. Unconsciously, a smile crawls across her lips. Next is Jack. Ah, Jack. Petey had caught his chiseled cheekbones and sparkling eyes. His mouth, too, with those lips all curvy and plump, which she loved to kiss, to trace with her index finger when they'd lie in bed, handsome like a movie star he was, looking like some blonde bombshell was going to walk right up and kiss him hard. Did you know about the bombshells, Petey? She takes a deep breath and lets her eyes fall on the third. It's Petey's self-portrait. I got the red hair right, but damn, there's something wrong with the mouth. Right, Mom? Don't swear. You're only 12. Okay, I'll start swearing next year. And he had grinned at her. It's an old man's mouth, Petey. All the wisdom of a Tibetan sage in the curve of your lip. No, I'm ripping it up. It's awful. Don't, Petey. It's really good. Anyway, haven't you heard what Sergeant said about portraits? She had lowered her voice to sound like a man. A portrait is a painting with something wrong with the mouth. <laughs> she stalls on the memory and in the pause becomes aware of a heaviness filling the room, weighing down on her shoulders like wet laundry. She walks to the sink, pours her coffee down the drain, watches it stain the porcelain brown and spread. Mortal sin seeping into a soul. Mamie again. A knock at the back door interrupts her thought. Damn, she whispers. Be right there, Ellen. She calls them, wipes her hands on the kitchen towel. 
so I'll listen to what she's got to tell me, but only for a minute. She checks the clock over the stove. It's almost time to go. But walking towards the back door, she is surprised. A black man stands on the other side where she thought Ellen would be. Without warning, the caution in the Trib article erupts. One person distracts you at the back door while another... She can't remember whether her front door is locked or not. She steps back out of eyesight and wants to default into a stumbling prayer. But for what? To whom? Mosley has spent the night out in the woods. He's gone up there in, in back of her house because this little kind of disabled man has gone lost from the mission where he works, and he thinks he might be up there. Another knock. She whispers, help me, Mamie. In the silence that follows her plea, she watches his fist rise to knock on the door a third time. The fist is loose. The skin between thumb and fingers dry and brittle, undirected even as it knocks on the door. She walks down the three steps, cracks the door open, and presses her cheek against its edge. May I, may I help you? Yes, miss. He smiles at her. She studies one of his hands, which hangs limply at his side, and notices that his eyes look tired. I, I don't buy anything door to door, she says. His broad smile reveals a front tooth rimmed in gold. Ah, I don't have anything to sell you, miss. A southern flavor li lilt flavors his voice. Just need a little drink. Whiskey, she thinks. He must notice the surprise in her eyes because he smiles again. Water, miss, that's all. Sure could use some water. Been outside a while. Okay, just stay right there. She closes the door, gets the water, and brings it through the kitchen and reopens the storm door. Thank you kindly, miss. Name's Mosley Albright, but most everybody calls me Old Mosley. She nods and waits for him to leave, but he remains by the back door, looking into her eyes so steadily she has to look away. Well, I'm glad I could help. I don't suppose you could direct me to the train from here, miss. Gotten kind of turned around. He looks down at his canvas sneakers, which must have once been a navy blue. Holes have been cut on either edge where his baby toes, crooked as dog legs, push through the slashes. Four blocks straight down the street, she holds tight to the storm door's handle and points from inside. Right kindly. I'll just be going now. He touches his forehead as though tipping his cap, then walks away. And she feels with that gesture an inkling of his past loves. Almost a vision is what it is. She gazes out past where the man guzzled water, past the garage's blue window box, the one that awaits the nasturtium seedling she plants every spring, and she can almost see him. Jack. Oh, Jack. Rake in hand, staring off into the woods on a Saturday morning under the apple tree, he was. Her eyes fill with tears as her mind rushes from Jack and then to Peggy. Petey, with his hair so red, it looked like it was on fire. Where have you been, my blue-eyed son? Where have you been, my darling young? But a sudden movement stops her singing. And so the third voice, and I, I guess it, everyone's waiting for Mishigami, what would he sound like? And how would you possibly take that on? Well, it kind of just happened. And as Alan suggested, it's our love for this lake and so many of the others of you who grew up in, in town here and have frequented its waters. He's known in the novel by his ancient name, Mishigami. Some humans say I am unpredictable, given to sudden volatility interrupted by bouts of gloom. They would be correct. Others say I am whimsical, that caprice skips along my edges, sings on the crests of my waves, thrills at the variation of my hues. They would be correct, too. 
Still others say, I am stable, a vast and wide expanse, providing power for their use and rumination for their overwrought souls. Ah, yes, they would also be correct. Yet it matters not a whit to me who claims what. I know what I am, sustenance and traffic, climate and reservoir, color and chorus, as rich in bounty as Gaia, Mother Earth, as vast in power as Zephyr's brother Wind, as profound in wealth as Aurelia's sister Sun, as strong and reflective pull as La Lunette, the ever-changing coquette. However, while I am not as advanced in years as these dear relatives, my provenance is just as profound. I am offspring of ancient glaciers, child of heaven's precipitations, spawn of the inland sea. You see, rich in history and poetry. Ah, but no, the poetry does not originate with me. Its incipience comes from an early tribe of humans, the Ojibwe who gave me the name Michigami when they inhabited my shores. It means great water. Yes, I am quite fond of it as it summarizes my profound essence in a mere four syllables, Michigami. The Ojibwe respected the sweeping role I played in their lives as they paddled and drank, washed in fish on my northern shores. You see, I was both consort and religion for them. It was as though, beyond being their great water, I was their great book, from which lessons of mind and body and spirit were learned. They danced at my shore, they chanted, spirit of great water, singing love in plenty, bringing healing power, master of our longings. You see, poetry again how they loved me. But then, most creatures do. Together we create the symphony of an ever-dynamic suite, the tittering of whistling chimes, the pounding drum roll of footfall or wave, the sonorous welling of a morning's call. When we play together in majestic rhythms, sometimes legato, sometimes allegro, sometimes prestissimo, we always always create a joyful noise that fills the earth with wonder. C'est magnifique. Oh, you may be curious at my understanding French. <laughs> nearly five centuries ago, I listened to the language of trappers and explorers as they wandered in nearby forests and traversed my tributaries. C'est vrai. But back to my point. Some humans never hear the orchestral sweeps, and many do not appreciate them, nor do they understand the price one must pay to keep us playing together in harmony. A pity. They devalue me in their vulgar accession of property and use of resources. Expansion seems their gold, the worser poison for my existence. Of me, Michigami, the great water, and yes, I am speaking of humans who have an unfortunate notion of my worth, which is a troublesome thing. Ah, but then I found her. I'm not sure how I knew she was the answer to my plea, but I remember the day especially well. Aurelia lolled overhead. Zephyros brought billowing clouds across the sky. Gaia fairly shimmered with goodwill. Even La Lunette's faint crescent lurked near the horizon. The five of us smiled in concert that afternoon, a day that made cause for animal celebration. An old woman, one she called Mamie, sat on a small rise 20 feet past Waterside. But the young one I call Nibiname, which is the Ojibwe name for spirit of the water. Yes, little Nibinabe gazed out at my horizon, and I watched her eyes sweeping out beyond me towards the sky. She was attached to my grandeur. From the first time she placed her tiny delicate foot into me, ah, but she was hesitant at first. I remember the old Mamie yelling from up on her blanket, put your foot in, Mary Margaret, it won't bite you. 
So in she placed it. You will forgive me if I pause for a moment. I still thrill at the memory. I licked the bottom of her foot and tasted such sweetness, sweetness as succulent as that of a summer peach, as that of still dripping honey from a honeycomb. How she laughed and kept giggling as I tickled the underside of her foot. So delighted was I that I recorded the sound of that laughter and copied the image of her face from that very moment. After some introductory licks, she snatched that foot away. Perhaps at first I was too bold with the sole of her foot. Perhaps I was too cold or too immense. But I would find out later it was fear of my power that ran through her little leg like the cracklings off a lightning bolt. Did she foresee the future? Hers? Mine? Perhaps. She tried again, holding her sweet foot above me, arched and pointed, attempting to triumph over her trepidation. Oh, I, I watched her hesitation with bated breath. When she placed her foot back in, however, something new arose within her. It did not crackle or spin. It flowed first within her, then within me, then between us. Um, so I am wondering if anyone has any questions you would like to ask. It seems like this is a good point before we get to that. And I'm going to make you do it. You can't, you don't really have to. But, but it's, it's the audience participation you know, point in the, um, in the presentation. But in, yes, and Peter, will you? He's, he's kind of in my ears because hard of hearing and can't see anything either. So, you know, that's just. <laughs> Well, thank you, Barbara. I you mean, well, the 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 issue with the audiobook, and I do know a lot of people really like audiobooks. I mean, they can. I'm not going to say iron and vacuum because oh, geez, but but you can you can take walks, you can you know be in the car and listen to an audiobook, and it's really wonderful. All I have to do is find a really good sound room to do it and the ability to sustain sustain patience to you know overcome the mistakes which I'm sure will be plentiful so anyway but thanks for asking that Tracy Flint <laughs> will you look at Tracy please Say it again. Well, Trish is going to speak to that uh, in the exercise, but the challenges of writing a voice of nature, one that doesn't. You are going to be so happy you asked that question because what we're going to do is a little exercise just because it's fun. Um, I'll give you index cards and pencils, and we'll play around with writing in the voice of something not human. And I think I was telling Casey earlier today that what happens when you, no, maybe it was Linda, I can't remember now. What happens when you be the tree, be the ball, you know, whatever it is, you really do become sensitized to whatever it is. And of course, your imagination takes flight, um, you know, because French, please. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I think it's a very interesting thing to do, to just allow yourself to do it. Permission granted? Oh, Linda, yeah.
the characters come to revolt? Well, in terms of how you envisioned the book originally. I had kind of the arc of, of the story, but I, I'm, uh, I used to say this even when I taught writing to kids. I'm a discovery director. I mean, I can intellectualize and have an outline, but that never quite works for me. And, and I think there are some people who are very good with the outline. They're logical and linear, but that does, that's not how I am. So I have to just let something breathe. And then if you know who Annie Lamott is, she writes these wonderful book of essays and she wrote a book called Bird by Bird. And one of her chapters is called Shitty First Drafts. <laughs> I am so a believer in that, but you allow yourself to be bad. I th and maybe that's true for anything. But the, the, the original, uh, you had two characters and then this ca constellation of characters in heaven who eventually became the lake because there was this wild and woolly country. Yeah. But then when you look at the original book, you know, there's a long part of it that's in the lake and then the other section is in the ocean. And you see that in the original and you start working on it and the same story they did. Yeah. So my question is, to what point from the original thought to seeing it in in court, and I'm sure it wasn't going to be the big hit on the movie set, I mean, what point did you say to yourself, this is it? Well, I, I can answer that because I was in a writing workshop and um, the writing group weren't, they were not buying. I had the queen, God was, was a female, of course. And, and um, the, the king of the underworld was male. I'm not going to say, of course, here. That would be mean. But, you know, so you had these two people, and, and he says, let's have a wager at, on Mary M. Is she going to kill herself, or is she not going to kill herself? And so they have a bet. And so you go into these worlds, the nether world and the, the world of the heavens. And the writing workshop group, they didn't like it. And it honestly, it kind of shut me down for a while, and I, I just floated, I, I would say, for a full year. And I don't know what came to me with Michigami, but it, it came. Inspiration, I guess. Yes, Michelle? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. When did, when did you start writing this book? Oh, gosh. It was at least six years ago. And, and so then, you know, I wrote, but um, I got put off for a while, and then I would come back and forth on it. And the pandemic, unlike for a lot of people, was a really good thing for me in terms of creative pursuits because I thought, hey, I'm sequestered anyway. So time to get it done. And, and I did. So I would say six years of, of writing off and on, and a lot of evolution took place too. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, TR. <laughs> I heard, uh, heard Bonnie at one interview, and she said she's just like this. Someone said, most writers are either bad people or stupid. And she said, you are the most remarkable of that. I wonder what you are. I got it. Okay. What was the last question? Uh, she said, are you a batter or a scooper? And he said, I'm a rotarian. A rotarian. <laughs> <laughs> Tom writes for a paper down in Naples still. Yeah. And he's got a lot of books under his belt, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, when things are going well, I'm a swooper. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's, you know, just slugging away on, on whatever. So, um, well, are you guys ready to play? Lola. Come Say yes. Lola and Carolyn, will you come on up? Lola and Carolyn, are they gone? Come on up and hand out these. All right.
Oh, yeah. Oh. So here I'm going to extol Tom Dunn, who is there. Raise your hand, Tom. He said, so we did a, a program here maybe five years ago, I'm not even sure, called Hidden Narratives. And people partook, and he really got into it and wrote a very fine interior monologue for one of Peter's um, figurative ballet paintings, which was quite nice. And this is not to be off-putting or whatever, but uh, if, if you put your name at the bottom of the index card, and as we go through this process, if you um, hit on a non-human entity that you think, okay, I'm going to play with this one, write that at the top of the index card, and then I'll take you through some exercises, and I'll wait for them to hand out the index cards and pencils. Notice the PowerPoint. So, because I believe, and I do believe, that we share this planet with plants, animals, even organic matter like rocks and clouds, I have found myself becoming sensitized to the rest of creation, becoming aware of my use and misuse of resources. I began walking around in the other's moccasins, even if that other was not human. The anthropomorphizing of being goes way back, well, certainly to Walt, Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse, Bambi, Thumper, further back to the Ojibwe's loving sister moon, and even further back to the Hawaiian outrigger canoe paddles, and this is true, we just discovered this, which they call grandmother, respecting them because they guide us forward in life through whatever seas one must traverse. So it's nothing new, but I think it's a cool thing to play with and try. The sensitization is what happened to me when I created Mishigami. His concerns for his own well-being and even feelings for his surroundings and denizens. So I thought I'd let you have a go at it. Whether you're a writer, a thinker, a planner, a doer, let's go. So, da 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 da. All right, so in the voice of, and, and bear with, just let it kind of roll with you. Okay. Dogs, they're inside our homes and inside our hearts. Many we know very, very well and love or find crabby and mean. Some people have birds. Where's Kate? There she is. She's got an amazing bird in her. Raise your hand. She's got one. They're inside our homes. Can you imagine what they've heard and seen even? Which is kind of cool. A tree. Some of them live for centuries. Can you imagine the history that they've witnessed? Do you have a special tree? Maybe it's a little fir tree in your backyard or a magnolia, which is just about over its full bloom right now, but a tree that is special for you that you think like, ooh, I can kind of relate to that. 
look at that face. And cats, they don't share much. But whether they're feral or friendly, they seem to be brimming over with thoughts. They just hold most of them inside, cavalier as they are. Even your favorite easy chair. Sight of scratchy gym shoes, heavy bottoms, privy to many conversations, perhaps moved willy-nilly all around the den. Does it take abuse? Does it sustain a semblance of stability and calm in your, thresh in your household? Now, if you golf, these, they might have issues, whether it's the ball or the club. What behavior might they have experienced or seen? Any swearing? So I'm going to the blue screen right now because if one of these things has struck you like, oh, maybe, maybe I could work inside of this non-human entity, whether animal, vegetable, or mineral, go ahead and jot one down. Maybe you'll come up with a better one in a second. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to like think. Look at this face. And houses aren't the only things that have faces. I mean, if you, I'm sure you've noticed cards. Oh, my God. Front and back have faces. And think about, I think it was a Pixar film, Cars, which brought faces and personalities to life in the front hoods of automobiles. What might this little domicile be thinking? Do you have access to a cottage? Did you know one when you were young? What might it be saying if it could express itself? What it's seen? what it worries about, concerns, peeling paint, etc. Check this out. Don't storms seem to be seething with emotion? Why? What could evoke those feelings? How would they express them? Yeah, what have they endured? I'm guessing that most men and women have an old pair of something by the back door. And how would they feel about their condition? What have they sacrificed or worked for? Are they appreciated? Maybe they're even really, really loved. What are they made out of? Where do they come from? So here's a page that's got, I think, almost all of the images that I showed. Now I would like you to commit to something, an animal, a vegetable, or a mineral, that you think like, ooh, I could play with this. Jot it at the top. If you've got two, go with that. And the next screens are going to ask questions that might allow you to speak in the voice of. Who would your being want to talk to? If it's an easy chair, maybe it's your big old butt. <laughs> if it's a golf club, if it's your dog, maybe he's got things going on that he can't tell you about yet. Would he want to talk or it want to talk to its owner, its keeper, another of its kind? something else. What would your being want to say? And I added a couple of sentences here that just kind of spark. I think about blank a lot. If there's one thing that frosts me, 
It's no one would believe it if I told you, but what tone of voice might your being have? And how elevated might its use of language be? Muddy Boots might have a way different voice than a German Shepherd. So I put cranky, sarcastic, happy, soulful, loving, Okay, I'll give you five minutes. Write a paragraph in the voice of your being about something to somebody for whatever reason. And don't forget to have fun. I guess you're gonna be a swooper, right? So here's the kicker. If you are willing, I'm going to, on, on the way, when we, when we leave, whenever you leave, leave your index card, identify your being, identify yourself, leave your writing, and I am going to post them on my website. Now, my sister Sally said, oh, yeah, real clever way of getting people to go to your website. And I thought, like, actually, I didn't think about that. I was just trying to, but you know what? Uh, maybe she's right. <laughs> but I think it would be really kind of fun to see what different people say, and then you could go there and see what Tom Dunn sends this time. <laughs> Anyway, I, I do want you to know again how deeply grateful I am for you to come here and to help me launch this book, and uh, your presence means so much. So anyway, thank you. And don't forget to pick up a couple pieces of beach glass, which I have collected. I have so many of them at Lake Michigan site. And Lola will help you with them if, uh, if you need to get them out of the little dish back there. So.
say Schulte? Schulte, yeah. much. I thoroughly enjoyed meeting you and your enjoyed your reading and it was so nice. I told Casey so when you write another book I'll be back. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. This was so much fun. Thank you. Oh, Have a great I have one last thing to say, and that is I have these very cute, not a ton of them, cookies that say Speed of Dark. So I would like to give them to the people who came the farthest. So is there anyone from Florida? Come on up. Is there anybody from Kansas City? Hello everyone. Sunglasses were left over here near the, the stools. Anybody sunglasses?
No, I got cookies. Oh, okay. Who came the farthest?